Black women have been misguided and even mistreated by their physicians since the advent of the U.S. medical system. One of the most well-publicized cases of medical mistreatment was that of Henrietta Lacks. She was a black woman who was misused by a team of doctors, inadvertently becoming the mother of modern medicine in the process. Her unlikely story changed the world forever but it came at the cost of her own life. The Complicated Story of the Immortal Woman Henrietta Lacks Henrietta was born Loretta Pleasant on August 1, 1920, but life was hard for her from the beginning. When her mother died giving birth to her tenth child, Henrietta was sent to live with her grandfather. She grew up alongside her cousin, David Day Lax, and they eventually fell in love and got married. They welcomed two children, both of whom were born when Henrietta was still a teenager. By the time World War II ended, the family had moved near Baltimore and the Bethlehem Steel Plant for Day's job. Henrietta cared for their five children, though her daughter Elsie, who had cerebral palsy and epilepsy, was eventually placed into what was then known as a hospital for the Negro insane. Henrietta only stood five feet tall but had a much larger presence. She was known for being personable, pretty, and a hard-working. But Henrietta couldn't have known then just how hard she'd have to work, not to mention influential she'd be in the coming years. You see, just after the birth of her fifth child, Henrietta started to feel like something was off. Henrietta noticed an unusual knot on her womb. The last time she felt a similar knot, she'd ended up being pregnant. But this time, she knew there wasn't a baby growing in her womb, but something more sinister. She visited Johns Hopkins Hospital in early 1951, and like many other black women in the 50s and today, she was nervous about trusting the medical institution. The hospital was segregated at the time and would remain so until Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. At the time, black people worried that they wouldn't receive the same level of care as white patients or would be subjected to secret medical experimentation. This wasn't just paranoia, either, Henrietta and other people of color had good reason to be nervous. Rumors circulated that Johns Hopkins surgeons were performing secret hysterectomies on black women without their consent. These rumors weren't as random as you'd think. The father of modern gynecology James Marion Sims did this for years to enslave black women against their knowledge. So it makes sense why this fear plagued black women for decades afterwards. There were other government-mandated eugenic programs to shrink the size of the black population, 30 states had them until as recently as the 70s. These would sterilize black women without their knowledge. The procedures were permanent, too, it's easy to see why Henrietta was so hesitant to visit a white doctor. But the knot in her abdomen wasn't going away. She had no choice but to make an appointment. At the doctor, a nervous Henrietta underwent a cervical biopsy. The results were grave. She was diagnosed with cervical cancer, and though she didn't know it at the time, the cancer was advanced. And on top of the fear undoubtedly caused by the diagnosis, Henrietta's other greatest fear came true. Her tumor looked unique to her doctor, Howard Jones, so he removed cells from the tumor for medical research, all without Henrietta's knowledge or permission. And therefore, she also had no clue that the cells taken from her tumor had an extremely rare ability that doctors had hardly ever encountered before. The second doctor, George Otto J., took more samples. He collected what would become one of the most important medical discoveries of all time. The Hella Immortal Cell Line. Although George's research was in its infancy, Henrietta's cancer was quickly draining her health. The doctor's research flourished while Henrietta's life was slowly extinguished. She returned to Johns Hopkins in August and insisted the hospital admit her for treatment. Henrietta spent her remaining time in the hospital, and she must have known deep down that she'd never go home again. By the time of her death on October 4, the cancer had spread throughout her entire body. She was 31. But to everyone's surprise, life was far from over for Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta's cell samples which are now called the Hella cells still lived and were named for their unknowing donor Henrietta Lacks. George J. was the director of tissue culture research at Johns Hopkins University and searched for cancer cells that continually divided and came from the same person. The Hella cells were exactly what he'd been waiting for. George believed that the Hella cells would lead him to a cure for cancer. The Hella cells were special. Instead of eventually dying, 
they continued to divide, hence their title as the Hella Immortal Cell Line. George claimed they were from a patient named Helen Lane to obscure his true source. George distributed the Hella Cell Line to his colleagues, and within two years, they were being shared by people in the medical field all over the world. By 2017, 142 countries had used the cells, and researchers continue to study the cell line to this day. The use of the cells in medical research led to some revolutionary scientific advances. Researchers have earned two Nobel Prizes, been given 11,000 patents, and written 110,000 papers using these immortal cells. The cells helped Jonas Salk develop the vaccine for polio, which saved countless lives and led to breakthroughs in the fight against cancer and AIDS, among other conditions. All the while, very few people even knew that the revolutionary cells came from a black woman who never consented to their use in the first place. In the 70s, scientists contacted the lax children about drawing their blood. Before visiting the family, physicians called Day to ask for his permission. Eventually, he agreed, but researchers never informed him what the blood was being used for. The family thought they were being tested for an unknown disease. For upwards of two decades, the Lax family had no idea that their mother's cells were being used without her permission. While no one bothered to tell the Lack family anything about the cells, the scientific community celebrated the cells' advances. The family didn't learn that the cells came from Henrietta until 1973, two years after the Journal Obstetrics and Gynecology revealed that Henrietta was the true origin of the cells, not Helen Lane. Day was irate about the medical industry's complete lack of empathy to his family and took legal advice from Dr. Sir Lord Keenan Kester Cofield, supposedly a distant relative. Keenan told the family he was a doctor and lawyer who could help them sue Johns Hopkins Hospital. In addition to justice for Henrietta, the family wanted to have more control over how much of their family's medical information was made public. But Keenan wasn't who he claimed to be. In fact, he was a total conman. This came out during the Hopkins trial, where he threatened to sue the Lacks instead. There were also plenty of tell-all journalistic novels and movies that dramatized Henrietta's life and didn't treat her story with respect. As far as we know, the Lacks have never received any kind of compensation for the use of Henrietta's genetic material, though not without trying. The family sued Thermo Fisher Scientific in 2021 for profiting off of Henrietta's cells. While some medical researchers made their fortunes in large part due to Henrietta's cells, Henrietta herself was buried in an unmarked grave on the land her ancestors once worked on as slaves. The Lax family is still dealing with Hella's cells and Henrietta's legacy. They've never been paid for these groundbreaking cells, but they were at least able to create something special from this terrible situation. The Henrietta Lacks Foundation. The organization aims to provide financial assistance to individuals in need and their families who have made important contributions to scientific research without personally benefiting from those contributions, particularly those used in research without their knowledge or consent. Henrietta's legacy lives on in the form of her cells, but a woman from before her time left a legacy in a much different form. America's first self-made millionaire wasn't born with a silver spoon in her mouth far from it. In fact, Madam C.J. Walker, known in her earliest years as Sarah, was born the daughter of slaves on a plantation. Obviously, her upbringing was anything but easy. By the time she was seven, her parents Owen and Minerva Breedlove had both died, leaving her an orphan. Luckily, she had five older siblings to teach her the ways of the world. Her only sister, Lavinia, helped raise Sarah alongside her own family. They moved to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where Sarah picked cotton and did housework. But Sarah didn't look back on this part of her childhood with fondness. During this time, she hated living with her brother-in-law. Her brother-in-law, Jesse Powell, never treated Sarah with respect the way she deserved. In fact, she claimed that he was physically abusive. So when she was only 14, Sarah married Moses McWilliams as a way of escaping Jesse Powell. They had one child together, Lelia, who later changed her name to Alelia Walker. When Moses died in 1887, Sarah sought a new start in St. Louis with her brothers. Sarah always knew that getting an education was her best path to success, so she got to work earning just enough money to send herself and Layla to school. 
Taking home just $1.50 a day by doing people's laundry, Sarah slowly but surely worked her way through school. A few years into this routine, Sarah began losing her hair. She had a scalp condition and had few options for hair care products. That gave her an idea. Sarah was struck by a brilliant question. What if there was a hair care product created solely for black women? Such products already existed, but they usually weren't mass-produced or accessible to the average working woman. She started looking into Poro hair products, which were created by Annie Turnbow Malone, a black entrepreneur. Inspired by their ability to help black women feel more comfortable in their appearances, Sarah knew she wanted to be involved with Poro products. So, Sarah moved from the laundry business to sales by selling Poro products. While she honed her selling skills, she planned her next move. To Sarah, her next move was obvious. She'd produce her very own hair care products, specifically those for women who were losing their hair. For about a year she experimented with making her own hair growth products. And it was during this time that Sarah found love again, this time with Charles Joseph, C.J. Walker, a sales and advertising specialist. The two married in 1906, and Charles helped Sarah with her product marketing and business strategies. She changed her name officially to Madam C.J. Walker and released her first product, Madam C.J. Walker's Wonderful Hair Grower. For 18 months, she traveled across the southern U.S. selling the serum door to door. A religious woman, one of Madam C.J. Walker's sales tactics was doing product demonstrations in churches. She was one of the women who was a pioneer in a multi-million dollar cosmetics and hair care industry, Alelia Bundles, Walker's great-great-granddaughter and biographer, said. Madam C.J. was a natural businesswoman with the sales tactics to prove it. Madam C.J. used before and after photos to demonstrate the hair grower's abilities. These tactics were incredibly effective, after all, they clearly showed how beneficial the product could be, if only the customer gave it a chance. Tin sold for 50 cents each, and in just two years, Madam C.J. was earning the equivalent of $150,000 every year. One of her favorite sayings was, there would be no hair growing industry if I hadn't invented it. And she's right. Though her original formula was lost, we know it had coconut oil, beeswax, petrolatum, similar to petroleum jelly, copper sulfate, precipitated sulfur, and a violet scent. But CJ also hinted at a secret ingredient. The secret ingredient was likely the MSM sulfur. A 2019 study found that this material increases keratin development, which supports hair and fingernail health. And along with the growth solution, CJ sold a special vegetable shampoo and glossine, a proto heat protectant product. Next, her company called Madam CJ Walker Manufacturing Company incorporated hair culturists to help sell her products in large cities. These salespeople, who were mostly women, learned valuable sales skills via CJ's Walker system, her self made training program. But it was at the height of her professional success that her personal life took a huge blow. Just as her business was taking off, Madam CJ caught her husband having an affair. She divorced him in 1912 and never married again. She lived in Indianapolis for a bit before settling in Harlem. Madam CJ was in the middle of a black cultural explosion and befriended such icons as Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Dubois, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Booker T. Washington. Teaming up with her daughter, Alayla, the two opened a fancy salon with Doric columns, parquet flooring, velvet seats, and a grand piano to greet guests as they walked in. She hosted a national convention in 1917 for her beauty culturists, where she both inspired them to sell and support the charitable Madam C.J. Walker Benevolent Association. Despite her childhood spent in poverty, Madam C.J. was generous with her wealth. She gave money to black colleges and to the NAACP's anti-lynching fund. She visited the White House in 1917 with a group to try to persuade President Woodrow Wilson to support legislation to make lynching a federal crime, CJ's great-great-granddaughter, Alia Bundles, said. CJ's wealth grew to such staggering heights that in 1918 Madam CJ moved into the gorgeous Villa Luero, an idolionate mansion in Irvington on Hudson. It was 20,000 square feet and had 34 rooms. Vertner Woodson Tandy, a black architect, designed the home. 
The only thing more impressive than the house was the home's inhabitants. Yes, Madam C.J. Walker completely changed the meaning and the limitations of the word success. Unfortunately, it wasn't long after she moved into Villa Luero that she passed away at just 51 years old. W.E.B. Dubois offered these words in her obituary. It is given to few persons to transform a people in a generation. Yet this was done by the late Madam C.J. Walker. And people were quick to honor Madam C.J. Walker even decades after her death. The Villa Luero estate is now a national historic landmark and has been restored by Ambassador Harold E. Dooley Jr. and his wife Helena. The couple lived in the mansion from 1993 until 2018, but the mansion's original owner left a legacy that was impossible to forget. Even in her will, Madam C.J. Walker left two-thirds of her future net profits to charity. And when she died in 1919, Madam C.J. Walker had something between half a million and one million dollars to her name, more money than any other black woman in the country at that time. She'd employed 40,000 black women and men, founded the National Negro Cosmetics Manufacturers Association in 1917, and inspired countless future people of color to make their own dreams a reality. Thank you for watching, please don't forget to like and subscribe.